thanks to the guests for being here. Um, some might ask why I'm moderating another panel again after I moderated the last one. The reality is that I'm a, a corporate attorney in a big Zurich-based law firm, and I have a lot of clients, investors, and entrepreneurs who are looking to enter the cannabis market into Europe, but specifically also into Switzerland. So I'm happy to do this here. Let's dive right in. Roberto, hola. Hola, Daniel. Perhaps you can give us a little bit of a background. How did you come to the plant? I actually started 17 years ago in Spain. I had a grow shop. So in Spain, always was legal to cultivate for yourself, at least tolerate it and consumption in your place. Uh, so we started, it's one of the first shops in, uh, in Madrid. Um, three years in the industry, in that industry, which is completely different than <laughs> what's going on today. Uh, I stop everything and I will live in abroad uh, in a background similar to yours on, on commodity trading mainly. Okay, so you started with EMAC Life Sciences. You're one of the, what was it, employee number eight or nine, something like that. And it's grown to be this pan European big operation today. How did you finance? the growth of this company? Perhaps you can give us some background. We started EMAC in August 2018. Uh, the first acquisition was done in, um, in uh, December 2018. So at the beginning it was complicated. We had very good management team that started from the beginning. Antonio, our CEO, was coming from the acquisition of Nuvera by Afria in Canada. Oh. And then he started as regulator for chief of regulation for Afria. And uh, they realized, was this concept, this approach, the Canadian and the US companies they were having with Europe, as treating Europe as a single market, was not necessarily the best approach to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, Europe is very segmented, it's very different from country to country, even we see with foods, we see, we see it with other products, with, but with medicine it's also complicated. So we said, we, from the beginning the vision from EMAC was how do we get cheaper, affordable uh, and good quality products to patients all across Europe. Mm -hmm. And for this we thought that we needed a vertical operator. Mm -hmm. Everything has changed a lot in the last three years, but we needed a vertical operator. So we raised money uh, to buy the first, um, our first GMP facility in, in Alicante. Where, where did you raise money? We started with uh, private equity and in, from the US. Private equity from the US? Yeah, exactly. In the US, they, had, they knew cannabis from before. Yeah. At the beginning, coming to Europe and asking money for cannabis, we were talking three years ago, was completely different. Mm -hmm. um, so we started with investors from the US. And then after the second round of equity with investors in the US, we started catching up attention from family office and hedge funds in, uh, in Europe. So the second uh, financing was, uh, the third financing actually was uh, through a convertible note uh, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of interest from uh, family offices and investors in Europe. Mm. <clears throat> well, actually, if we look at the European landscape, the majority of startups today that I know at least are financed by private individuals or by family offices and not necessarily by private equity funds. Perhaps some VC funds now entering the, the scene as we've seen uh, uh, recently, Marcus, uh, you represent a family office as well, right? That's right, yeah. So that's one of the things that I do. I represent um, a London-based family office, and I really got into this industry um, from the investor's side as well. Um, back in 2016, 2017, I worked with a family office in the US at that point, and we invested into uh, Bedrocan, which is a Dutch company. Yeah. Um, I think one or the other might know Bedrocan in this room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they've done quite well. And uh, then I, I kind of switched back and forth a few times between industry and investing, and at the moment I advise. Um, a family office in London. I work with a few different companies. Um, so I'm kind of lucky enough to be able to pick and choose. Mm. Maybe going back to you, Roberto, on, uh, on EMAC Life Sciences, which was recently acquired by Curly for an enormous sum. Um, 
this whole transition from a small operator to being a relatively large pan-European operation, how did the private equity fund in the US support this expansion? Did, did you think it was imperative to have someone who's already done and scaled previously in the US support you in these, uh, uh, in these plans in Europe? Or do you think you could have done the same with the family office with perhaps much less background in cannabis? One of the difficulties from, uh, from a cannabis company, I think, is raising early capital. When everything is uh, running smooth and you have a good operation, always it's uh, easier to catch attention from investors. Mm -hmm. So in a way, yes, for me, one of the most important things in wet raising capital is, is the team you have. Mm -hmm. The team is saying everything. You know, when some, many people came to me asking, uh, how do you think you will succeed in Europe? Why is your model? Uh, why do you think you will grow, be able to grow in Portugal, extract in, uh, in Spain, in Spain, uh, manufacture flowers in, the, in Spain that cannot be sold in, in Spain as GMP product, but we can distribute in Germany? And my answer always said, Antonio was the person actually who brought Uber and, uh, and Bwin in Europe. So not in cannabis necessarily, but he had a proven track record of bringing and opening new markets. Okay. So, yeah, make your team is one of the best things uh, in cannabis, no? We bet in people. Yeah, absolutely. Is that also how you're looking at the companies that you've acquired in the various jurisdictions around Europe? Um, have you done the due diligence very strongly team-based? Is that, is that the main focus? Now, the val there is not many companies in Europe making money and good quantities of money with cannabis. So what you buy when when one of the most important things is obviously the licenses that these companies have, but to get to the, these early licenses in, the, in cannabis mm -hmm. is the team that they manage to, to get these licenses. I mean, with the team in Spain, we got the, um, the, all the GO GMP certification for growing and so, which is, was one of the first growing licenses in Spain. Mm -hmm. Normally, the period to have this is about two years. With the wonderful team we had, we, in less than one year, we had all the licenses and we are we can produce APIs, magisterial preparation, experimental drugs, uh, GMP flowers. Mm -hmm. So it is, everything is the team. Okay, the team and obviously also licenses, something that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Any other main parameters that you're looking at when making an investment in acquiring a new operator in, uh, in a new European jurisdiction? Early access to market. This is one of the key things. If you can be one of the first bringing something, in, something new into a market, now we know it's complicated. In the UK, for example, uh, we've been one of the first companies being able to actually distribute our products. So we have several products through our laboratory being uh, distributed to patients in the UK. Mm. Um, okay. So you were, would you say you were lucky to find a private equity fund in the US? Absolutely. To be, to be uh, one of the first giving you the whole... Yeah. We managed to raise, in, the, in total, we raised uh, 50 million pounds in a, in, a, in a year. In one year. And that really gave you the possibility to scale and to go on this acquisition spree mm -hmm. that you did in Europe. We did both things. We bought uh, companies already licensed. For example, Terra Verde in Portugal was the second uh, cultivation license after Bedrocans. Uh, so this was very strategic. Yeah. And uh, we were buying a license in Spain. The, when we bought the laboratory, they didn't have any license for cannabis. They were an API producer for 21 years, okay. but they had experience with the agency. Mm. So it, it, you need to be a, a hybrid. But also we develop uh, organically. For example, in Germany, we have a fully owned subsidiary that we developed from scratch, asking all the licenses in place. Same okay. as in Switzerland. Yeah. Okay, so obviously you had a really experienced team, also experienced in scaling businesses into Europe that were successful in the US. You had, uh, that explains perhaps the secret sauce why you were able to, to scale up the way you did in Europe. Um, and also uh, really access to a big coffer of capital in order to be able to... Uh, this is key to fund that. Now, not everybody has the privilege of obviously having 50 million bucks in, in, in the back to be able to do that expansion. There is other ways to raise funds today. Uh, perhaps, Daniel, what do you think about crowdfunding? <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so, from our own experience in crowdfunding, we have 
I've seen crowdfunding already in our own family office where um, it was a setting where we acquired a brand, but we're talking about you know, technology at this stage. We acquired a brand and we thought, how can we put it onto the market? And crowdfunding kind of came to, came to mind to us because um, it's a great way to market your product. It's a great way to put it out there, to put your brand out there, to have thousands of people look at a wonderful video of your product and to try to buy into it. Um, what happened with us in the electronics, and I'll bring it back to cannabis in a minute, but what happened to us in the electronics is that, you know, it was about two years ago, we had a wonderful brand called Philips. We were pushing it onto the market, and all of a sudden, there's something called the, you know, the chip shortage. I don't know if you've heard of that. So yeah. we've been, uh, we had been talking about this for about already a year, pre-COVID, basically. And, you know, as this started to go, we were having issues with delivering the products. Um, you know, we had to tell 4,500 backers why their beamers were weren't getting shipped to their place, you know? So it was beamers, basically, it for, was. for, okay. Yep. And um, so I think if you bring back to cannabis, it, with the positives and the negatives, I think that when I see a cannabis company that's been raising funds through uh, crowdfunding, basically, I first of all, I see a very messy cap table. I see a cap table that's full of people, as I'm not really sure. It doesn't give me validation either. Mm -hmm. For me, having, having a company that has managed to do a wonderful video doesn't mean that their product is actually worth something. Mm -hmm. So, and, uh, and yeah, imagine that actually this company, you know, it's a startup usually, or, you know, it's a company that that's basically building itself. If, yeah. they, if they mess something up, it's a, a thousand you know, bad-mouthing ambassadors that are out there you know, putting down your brand. So we see it a little bit negatively. In, uh, so cap table, perhaps for the audience, if not everybody familiar with the vernacular, um, is a, an overview of the shareholders of a company. That's what it is. Yeah. Right. And that's obviously, if you have four and a half thousand backers, then you can imagine how a general assembly would look like. It, it uh, has, of course, its uh, advantages, but it might also have a lot of uh, operational disadvantages and uh, right, legal right. implications. Right. Uh, you do raise capital quite quickly, and you get to have your brand out there, but there are negatives as well. So. Yeah. So you work with uh, Teka Capital, perhaps. Right. Uh, you can shed a bit of background what you do with Teka. Okay. Um, so. We built Teka with having in mind that the cannabis ecosystem uh, is, is pretty complicated, actually, if you look at it from an investor point of view. I mean, you have companies that are growing, others that are doing brands, others are doing genetics, uh, some are in medical and you know, recreational and hemp. They're, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a jungle out there. So basically, we, you know, we had in mind that Basically, if you look at the investors, there are you know, maybe a, a few funds, a few VCs maybe out there, but most of them are today are going to be you know, business angels, high net worth individuals, family offices, people like this, who are going to be interested in coming into the, the market. So what we decided to create was basically to, to leverage this network, first of all, because we have it from our, our other industries in which we're active in. Um, and to basically go to, you know, companies that are starting in the cannabis field. So if you want startups, but some of them obviously are more, more advanced. Um, and basically, first of all, we, we talk to those startups, we interview them, we try to see where, where do they fit in this constellation of the cannabis world, kind of. And then we, you know, we try to identify their needs. Are there, most of them are raising capital, but, uh, you know, it could be something else. They could be, you know, willing to go into another geography, for example. Um, or looking for a joint venture. So we look at what their need is and we try to basically help them out with this. So we have them there and then on the other side we're talking to investors who, who we also need to listen to. We also need to know what kind of profile do you have, where do you want to go, do you want to touch the plant directly or you want to stay away from it because you're still you know, kind of afraid of it. Um, so, and so we're trying to bridge those two things basically where we're trying to say, hey, we're listening to you, we're listening to you and this is how we can make something work. On top of this, um, what's interesting about Teka Capital and what I liked a lot about it is that we're, you know, geographically we're, we're in Israel and in Switzerland slash, you know, okay. EU and of course everybody in cannabis knows someone in the US, so we're also, you know, so, but mostly Israel, Switzerland, let's just say, and, and Europe. And so what's interesting is that you have those different profiles where we have a lot of entrepreneurs in Israel that have made their, their successes maybe in tech or in something else who now have the money. Cannabis is, as much as it's illegal, is still um, very much tolerated over there. So we have a lot of people that are kind of curious, investors also. And, a, and for a lot the audience, maybe in Israel, there's been a medical program in cannabis for over 20 years. It's very... Uh, very, very accepted and destigmatized. Um, I'm half Israeli, by the way, as well, and I go there regularly, and I can say for a fact that it's very, um, yeah, very accepted 
uh, a lot of patients with uh, neuropathic pain, for example, they get a bouquet of pre-rolls every month. And uh, it's actually cannabis flower that is the most dispensed medicine in Israel today in, uh, in cannabis. But that's on a side note, yes. Well, if you think about it, there's also this whole issue around PTSD, you know? We have a lot of people, young people, who come back from, from seeing things that they, sh yeah. you know, maybe shouldn't have seen at this age. And so they come back with PTSD, and so a lot of them are consuming for these reasons as well. Yeah. So yeah, it's true, it's very accepted, but it's still illegal, even though it's uh, uh, medically accepted. So, so basically, we're trying to bridge those two things where we try to see, hey, we have Israel, we have investors over there, we also have really cool innovations over there. It's the startup nation, you have this whole dynamic of, of uh, there's government funding also for startups. And then, you know, in, in Switzerland, we do have investors, there's, let's say, more conservative with regards to the Israeli ones, um, but they're still curious. So trying to bridge those yeah. two things, bringing innovations to Switzerland, bringing investors, Swiss investors to Israel, where we say, hey, the market is more, you know, more like this, more like that. So it, we're trying to bridge those two. Education obviously is also very key in terms of educating investors uh, in Switzerland now in particular to, to understand what the market potential is. Right. Um, um, yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at the investors we're talking to, I was talking about business angels at one point. Who are business angels? Business angels are people who have, you know, 100,000 Swiss francs on the side that they'd like to invest in something that they believe in. You know, maybe they, they are doctors or lawyers or, you know, it, it, maybe they're not really versed on what cannabis is. So you need to sit down with them. You need to tell them, listen, you know, it's not, it, it's not what it used to be. It doesn't have that same image, you know, of uh, 10, 20 years ago. It's something different and the potential in it from, I mean, if we look at today, hemp, for example, hemp is like... I don't know, it's a miracle plant, you know, like in a way that you can take the, you can take the stem, make a, a hundred business models out of it, you can take the flower, make a hundred business models out of it. Uh, and there's just so much information that you need to be able to listen, basically. And I think that a lot of what we do, very, very often the first interviews, we just ask questions and we listen to what the person wants and where they want to invest. So business angels, obviously also uh, great potential, but also very limited in terms of how much additional capital you can raise. That's something to consider. It's like the other end of uh, the private equity kind of big ticket backing that you might have from the beginning. So one really has to consider the plus and minuses of... Uh right, right. But I'd like to just add to that, that actually in Teca Capital, what we've put together is basically a way for investors to syndicate on one deal. So okay. someone can come in at, at 50K, for example, 50,000 Swiss francs, uh, and we could get maybe five of those, you know? And all of a sudden you have a 250 ticket that you can go and invest. And okay. so what's interesting about this vehicle that we've created is that, you know, it's, it's tax-wise it's quite lean, which is very often an issue yeah. for investors. Knowing, you know, we're all investors around here, so we, we know what this is. Um, so actually being able to have this vehicle where people can come in and things are clear, uh, rules are set and you know, you don't have to be from Switzerland, you can be from Israel or you know, from Germany and look at an opportunity in Switzerland and so we enable all of this and at the same time we're not just there as Teca Capital to basically uh, sell you something. Very often we do the due diligence with you. And because we have two partners that also represent a family office, there is also a possibility for us to tell investors, listen, if we go on this, we can go on this together. We can also put down, you know, 50, 100K and join you and be part of this. And then Tega Capital takes another form where we really become advisors. And this is why we, we consider ourselves advisors. Marius, coming to you, how yeah. did you touch the plant? I touched the plant um, not too long ago, to be honest. Um, so I'm coming from a startup world. So basically based in Berlin means that I'm uh, for, for the past 15 years part of this um, movement, so to speak. And it's interesting now to be in the, in the cannabis world because you can draw a lot of uh, similarities, comparisons. Um, I often feel myself uh, back in time to 2006 Berlin startup world. So it's what I see in cannabis. It's, and it's it wouldn't say it's early infancy, but it's uh, it's at the start. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you you can draw also a, a, a nice uh, story. I was talking to a friend of mine, is the founder of Idealo, Martin Zinner, and he basically founded his uh, startup in 1996 okay. uh, when before the first bubble burst, yes, he, 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 overcome, he overcame that first bubble and he was still operating and navigating and wasn't really sure if that leads to something. He, he, he later sold the thing to Axel Springer for a couple 
of tens of millions, um, but he basically said what saved our asses was DS DSL, broadband internet. Yeah? And compared, comparing that to the cannabis industry, I would say we are still in modem age here. Yeah? Um, and we are about to enter when you know the, the, hype, the hype cycle, so you come from a trigger event, go to an um, exceptional um, yeah, culmination, and then you go into a little depression. And I think right now we are entering this depression moment. And as, uh, another thesis I have is like 80% of the companies who will run and win the market are not even founded yet. Yeah? Yeah. That, that I could be wrong, but this is my, my thesis. So that's, that's from the tech experience, yes, right? That yes, you think yes, it yes. could be compared yeah. to the cannabis market. I mean, you have to, you have, to have a, a, um, a thriving ecosystem, and that means like people like you, investors, um, but the, also in depth, right? Um, also in depth in terms of money, in terms of knowledge. Um, and what, what you see right now is that the, the scene is very much focused on cultivation. There's a, a big uncertainty from the, from the regulators, um, which also makes, it, makes the life for investors very hard, mm -hmm. because to attract money, you need a certain kind of trust, which is not given in every jurisdiction right now. We're talking about Europe especially. And once we can bridge that gap, uh, and that is, I think, the moment where we are right now, um, the future can be bright. If we cannot bridge that gap... Mm -hmm. What do you think see? needs to happen in the cannabis industry so that it becomes more accessible for, for investors yeah. as, a, as a story, cannabis. Yeah, I think there are early innovators and adapters already on, in the market which um, lay the foundation. I think what needs to happen is more research mm. um, on, the, on the one hand, because I mean, we're talking about two cannabinoid, cannabinoids right now. The plant has 120 and more. Um, so there's so much more potential to be discovered. But that needs time, that needs also uh, some willingness and some, some risk capital to, to be invested. Um, and the other thing is definitely it's harmonizing of legislation. Um, yeah. So all those scattered and unclear uh, legislations, you know, it's like this is a, a nightmare for everyone who wants to invest. Yeah. Yeah, it's also a nightmare for the lawyers, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, we don't hear you complaining. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's interesting, but it's also frustrating. And we do believe that obviously these harmonization efforts will lead to something, but it's going to take a long time. And I think everybody who's in it in this business knows that it's a more long-term play. You were saying cultivation. There's also other fields in cannabis you can invest into, and you are now a part of Cannavigia. Perhaps you can give a short background. How and. You know, it explains your tech yeah. background that you invested perhaps in that company. Yeah, so basically I'm coming from the tech world um, and the founder of Cannaviga, Luke, is a friend of mine and um, I was on the other side. I was an advisor at the beginning of the company and I said, okay, Luke, do your first steps on your own. I guide you and if, if we see that you're able to swim, I, I maybe will join and this is, that happens basically this year because um, what I saw to myself is um, when there's a gold rush, start selling shuffles, don't start digging, you know? And that's basically what, what Scanaviga is doing. Um, uh, <laughs> we're selling the shuffles yeah, to, to lay uh, the basis for, uh, for something which is transparent, uh, which delivers tr transparency to the market. Um, and I think that's, it, it doesn't have to be Canaviga, but there has to be a layer of transparency. Yeah. You know? So for, for, yeah. for the crowd, Canaviga yeah. is a seed to sale transparency software solution yeah. that- uh, Compliance. Compliance, right exactly. now. So from, from seed to sale, you can basically track and trace every single step in your production or in your distribution or manufacturing. Um, okay. yeah. Alex, coming to you. Short question. Um, what type of, okay, what do you do now? Because you're also involved, you have a tech background and now you're involved in a tech startup. Uh, correct. Uh, so yeah, my background is very similar actually. And to him, I yeah, had co-founded two startups, successfully sold them in the US. And on the side, I invest heavily in early stage startups, mainly UK, a bit of Berlin, and a bit of US. Uh, most of the times it's pre-seed, seed, and series A. I'm an active investor. And at the moment, I've co-founded uh, two years ago, a company called Can Exchange, which is basically a trading platform and infrastructure to trade the um, cannabis raw materials. Yeah. And I served as, as a co-founder and CEO. So you're also selling shuffles, basically, exactly. right? Because you need transparency, you need a platform. Exactly. Um, why do you think your platform is different? 
from Canaviglia? No, not from Canaviglia, but from yeah. other platforms perhaps that are sort of a B2B marketplace. Yeah, I mean, uh, when we started, we were looking at the market in terms of what platforms exist out there. There were quite a few, but what we saw is that most of them actually had just like an inventory. We introduced buyers and sellers, which is good, but I think not enough. So we took another approach looking at what banks are doing, other commodities are doing, because mm. hemp is going to be the next commodity. So how can we help this become? So we took a step back and, you know, anyone who comes on the platform needs to be KYC, due diligence, banking levels. Then we, we use partnerships with two laboratories to create standardization on your lab results and everything. And we have pricing indexes, which actually show you the real price that the product has been traded. We are very lucky actually to have one of our investors to own a bank. And we were the only ones who can offer a payment solution to secure payments for the buyers and the sellers. So actually with escrow uh, Correct. solution, Correct. you That's send a we COA do. and then it gets released, the funds for actual. For Correct. Correct. Okay. That's interesting. So yeah, our whole approach was actually transparency, mm. due diligence. And you said something important here. You said one of your investors, you're lucky, owns a bank. Yes. That's convenient. Very convenient. So you have to be very wary of what type of investors you bring in, how did you do that when you started? Of course, you had a few exits, successful entrepreneur, but still, how did, what was, except from your own money that you invested, how did you approach investors? Because actually the majority of the investors I have on board now, they're C-level executives from commodity houses, banks, mm -hmm. from the tech entrepreneurs like me. So I really brought people who can understand what we're looking to build. And okay. so far, they've helped a lot. And it's very important for a startup to have valuable investors around you. OK, let's move to Marcus. Marcus, uh, obviously, also very successfully invested in various uh, cannabis businesses. Uh, what are the most important attributes that you're looking at? If you're getting a pitch deck, what, what is it that you look at? I think there, there, are, there are many uh, attributes that we look at. But I think some of the most important ones are the team. The team is front and center. If you, if you do not have the right people um, working on solving a problem, and if the people don't get along between themselves and work together on something, then you're not going to be successful. Um, can I dig into that a bit yeah. more? Maybe there's some entrepreneurs in the room that ask themselves, what does that mean? Everybody says it's about the team. The team is important. What exactly do you look in the team? What, what are the factors? I mean, it depends kind of on the specific company that you're looking at. But um, I mean, for example, Canavigia is, um, you know, a company that um, is on the edge between compliance and technology um, and, um, you know, facility management and that type of stuff. So and logistics also. So it's important that you have people in there who understand tech, that understand uh, logistics, that understand compliance. All of that needs to come. You need to have people that understand every single aspect. That, that understand the, the different aspects of a business mm -hmm. and they need to successfully work together. Another company that we invested in is Omura, right? Um, vaporizer company. Um, and with that company, it was the same. Um, the team is made up of uh, guys that had worked in big tobacco in the, in the past. Um, one of the founders um, has uh, a, a brand that, uh, that designed products for um, like Apple accessories, um, okay. so you know, and there was there's a scientist that understands vaping technology. So it's it's that kind of you know you need the combination, and the combination needs to work as well. So before exactly. you invest, you actually go and see the people in person. A hundred percent. We always do. Um, we've never invested in anything, uh, even throughout COVID. We we tried to see people um, and and go and experience the product, um, see how meet the people individually, but also see how the team works together and how they interact with each other. I think that's super important. Yeah. We were talking about going back to the various verticals that there are in the cannabis business. Yeah. Uh, Alex, you chose to also go into the tech side. Why did you choose tech? Of course, I know some your background, yeah. but specifically why tech and not cultivation? Because you're also a private investor, right? You have other companies in your portfolio. Um, why tech and not cultivation or distribution or what else? Uh, yeah, so basically I was brand. actually looking into going to investing in cultivation in the US. Like for the past seven years, I was looking either cultivation or dispensary chains. 
I couldn't really find a good opportunity, let's say. I saw a lot of business plans, but they were the same and the same from different entrepreneurs. So I was like, okay, it's a big market. Who's going to make it out there? And then, when actually I got together with my co-founders and started discussing our idea, I didn't want to be exposed only to one segment of the industry. I don't want to be just a CBD brand or one farm or something. I want to be able to capture the whole 360 degrees view, which makes you more diversified, more revenue streams as a business, etc. And of course, tech is something that we know how to do. My co-founders have a very strong background in finance, and we combined the experience we had, and we went into that. Mm -hmm. We all know that platform businesses are usually very challenging. Let's put it like Extremely this. Extremely challenging. Spe specifically challenging to stand out, to really get to a certain revenue stream that is, uh, and, and, and really make a, a mark. Um, how do you make yourself attractive, basically, for investors? Um, I mean, you're very right. Yeah, it's hard to make, not, not hard to make revenue, but it's hard to make profit. Revenue, it's not that hard, but if you want yeah. to scale very fast, yeah. you need to sacrifice your profit compared to that. So the thing is all about, you know, the scalability you have, because in other, if you do a farm, you can scale up to an extent. If you're a global tech business, the multiples on exit are 10x at the good scenario and way more in better scenarios. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you actually sell them what you're trying to do. You're ahead of the market on what you're doing, and actually you doing something that can actually in the future be valued a lot of money for them and they can have an actually a multiple exit on their investment and it's all about how you position yourself your product your team for them to believe in you and believe what you're doing actually will be valuable one day and take basically following the let's say startup tech approach of raising capital marcus in your capacity in, in a family office and you see a lot of pitch decks where do you think is the biggest potential going forward for, for investments in the cannabis space? I think this is actually a, it's a great question and it's a super interesting time in the cannabis industry because what we are seeing now and I think probably a lot of people are seeing this as well is the divergence of the industry a little bit into strictly medical and pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical rather and into recreational and wellness and all of that on the other side. So, so far, you know, I spoke about Bedrocan. Bedrocan um, is growing flowers and those flowers were being sold as medical products. But at the same time, we all know that there are some, you know, medical patients that are really, in, you know, consuming those flowers for their own enjoyment. I think that's something that is going to change. And going forward, there will be actual pharmaceutical businesses and there will be wellness and recreational businesses, depending on the legal frameworks and what is allowed, of course. But I think that's definitely a trend that... Okay, so there is a trend of yeah. specialization. Yeah. But the question was, where, where would you put your money? Where do you see the future? Where do you see more return for investors? So going personally, at the family office, um, we... So at the family office and also personally, um, I would say we are looking very closely at pharmaceutical. Um, that's by far, you know, it, it's, it's just a much larger market, um, uh, not in cannabis at the moment, but in the overall game. So I believe if you can be successful in um, the pharmaceutical arena and if you can, um, I, I, we have to remember that, that at the moment there are only, I think, four uh, cannabis-based medicines that have actual FDA approval. Yeah. And those four medicines are all based on two compounds, THC and CBD. And two of those medicines are made by GW Pharma. So it's, it's a tiny, tiny industry. And we all know that this plant has so much more potential to treat other diseases, other ailments. So that's really what we are looking at. You know, how can we um, find um, a company that, that you know, works on developing products that uh, treat, I don't know, gastrointestinal disorders or other types of pain, um, all of that type of stuff. That's, I think that's hugely interesting. Can Mark? I add something here? Uh, sure. Uh, this is, uh, I totally agree with you. Actually, in EMAC, we started from the beginning with a research approach on medical products, medical, medical, medical. Yeah. We did other things around, but we are very focused on research. The first deal we did was a, a clinical study in the UK for pain with the Imperial College of London. Yeah. And, and this, is really, this is really important uh, for the acquisition by Kudalif. Kudalif, what they did with us was to invest in an existing network, pharmaceutical network in Europe already. Mm. So this was key. This is one of the points that were key for the for our purchase. Mm -hmm. 
Marius? Yeah, I've something to add from uh, from a uh, point of view of an ex-incubator. Um, so talking about this incubation system, which is not really established in the cannabis world um, already. I, I saw Kan Negev in Israel is existing, but lo small little programs. So an incubator is basically a facility where you can go as a founder with no idea or with an idea and, and you work for like a couple of months in, a, in an environment where all necessi uh, necessities are delivered by that incubator. And in the end, you have a demo day and then you represent to investors and you afterwards, hopefully you can, you can start and run your business. Models like this are not existing in, in the cannabis world right now, which for me would be, uh, is, a, is a gap. So if someone is interested to run in, in cannabis or whatever, uh, I think this is the time now um, with, with, the right, with the right people, with, with the right um, yeah, capitalization. Um, because I think there's a lot of potential out there in the, in the research world. Yeah, I'm an early investor of ResearchGate, which is like the Facebook for, for scientists. And scientists and business people are normally not connected to each other. Mm. So, um, but especially in that case of cannabis, where so much research has to be done in the future, I think there's a huge potential to connect those worlds together, you know. Um, also, also a huge risk, because um, the outcome yeah. is unclear, but potential is much higher, I guess. Especially Just when it don't comes. call it Cannavator, because it's yeah. getting too confusing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's okay. a working title. Marius, <laughs> let's sit together after this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Okay. I mean, there are a lot of pitfalls when you, when you do incubation. Um, I can tell you also about it. Um, but I think in this special case, cannabis is a very uh, okay. interesting moment right now. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm serious. Um, okay. <laughs> One more point. Where would you not invest in, Marcus? Well, one of the areas that, again, us um, at the family office um, do not look at at all anymore, to, to be honest with you, is, um, you know, the next um, outdoor cultivation facility in, in country X, um, simply because I think it's, uh, it's kind of a race to the bottom. It's, uh, and this is... On the more general level, I really think one thing that the, the cannabis industry could do a lot better in is innovation and new ideas. At the moment, there's a lot of copy and paste. Uh, I mean, at one of my last jobs, I, I spent quite a lot of time in, in Southeast Asia and um, Thailand, you know, recently opened up and um, now other countries in that region are talking about opening up and everybody wants to, you know, grow flour and export to Europe. But that, that's not possible, right? <laughs> At some point, there isn't enough of a market to take up all of that flour. We saw what happened in Canada with the flour prices there. So um, we at the family office stay away from, from cultivation at this stage. Mm. At the same time, cultivation really is at the basis. And uh, I remember from my experience as a commodities trader, yeah. right? everybody was saying, yeah, you're buying one more mine, and uh, does this really make sense? But you saw at some stage that those players who were fully vertically integrated, and that will happen in this market as well, actually had an edge because they understood the real commodity, they knew exactly how it is produced, that there's a certain quality control if you have everything in-house. Do you see any... I do agree Advantages with you. With it. Yeah. I, I do agree with you, and I think it's not uh, a coincidence, for example, that GW Pharma does their own cultivation. Yeah. Um, so I hear that argument quite often with vertical integration, and yes, I get it. And there are some companies that do that well, but the overwhelming majority of, of decks that we see for cultivation, you know, it's not it's not vertical integration. It's just somebody trying. To thinking that they can do price arbitrage um, by exporting, which at the end of the day is usually not successful. Yeah. Good, I think we should slowly but surely open up uh, the round to questions from the audience. Maximilian, I hand over to you as well. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, again, yes. Especially Daniel for all the good questions and all of you for the stunning answers. It's really interesting. So I think there are a few questions. We have to limit it on to 15 minutes. Um, it would be great if you could just tell us who you are and where you come from and um, who your question goes to. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Very sad that I have to say gentlemen and old lady in that forum. 
Mm. Daniel, that's your job for the next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was hard. But bring, bring on some recommendations and we will definitely, I talked to Ben, we, we have to make this Give happen. Me a call There's next no time. question. There, that was not intentional. Okay, that's yes. what, that, that was. So thank you very much. And my name is Dov, Dov Barguera. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a member of the Teka Capital team. And we are doing advisory to uh, early stage cannabis companies. Marius, I like uh, your remark, amazing remark, because I'm uh, originally from Israel. Mm -hmm. And actually, what we see today, the startup nation, is based on the creation of incubator. The initial money before a single VC knew in Israel how to write the word VC was that the Israeli government gave a lot of money to incubation facilities. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I really recommend that we should work together. So we have here six gentlemen who are very deep into the industry. Do you see a chance that each of us here in this, ro in this room today is going to help to raise funding and to put in place an incubator, maybe the first one in Switzerland or eventually in Berlin. Thank you very much. Investors, huh? <laughs> no pressure, guys. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can start. Um, I'm not an investor, maybe not the right one to answer that. Um, I think waiting for, for governments is something which I wouldn't advise, to be honest. Israel is maybe an exception because you guys are fast and you're, you're an innovative country anyway. So waiting in Europe for, or especially in Germany, can talk for Germany, for uh, government money, I wouldn't recommend that. Nevertheless, I mean, there are already, like you, you, told, uh, you said it already, um, you have internal re uh, research and um, I think Pew is also doing a lot of research internally. Yeah. I was al also talking to Gavin the other day and he said, you have to open up your campus for the public, you know, um, and something like this into, an, um, into one approach can make things much easier in, in terms of like everyone else, everyone is doing his own little lab, you know. Um, so maybe... Um, Ige Hanf could be like a facilitator for that. Yeah. Um, so give, bring, bring people on, uh, on the table, but in the end, I think it needs to be privately invested money, which can drive that innovation much faster than anything else. There is, uh, there is programs. Portugal, for me, is one of the countries in Europe leading the way on cannabis. And Portugal, for example, they have this program, Portugal 2020, which they are canalizing a lot of money mm -hmm. into cannabis companies a lot in the growing space, mostly in creating value in the country, not just doing something to export, so they want to generate money in the country, and they are investing, they are giving this money free of interest, mm. which is, uh, as, as soon as you can get a proper deck, uh, I will be looking at this kind of uh, funds, uh, because uh, these if guys I, take your money. If I can add to that, I think Switzerland would actually be a great place to, to have an incubator, considering the, the background in innovation, fast-moving consumer goods, pharma industry, uh, foodstuff industry. Uh, these are the verticals that I think will grow dramatically over the next years. So definitely the time is ripe for something like that in Switzerland. And if you guys want to sit down, let's do that. <laughs> um, we have got more questions. One second, I'll try to... Get one by one. Madam, please. Hi, my name is Alicia Schweiger. I own a company called Minodier, and I support um, women entrepreneurs. I have a two-part question. The first one, I've been following the cannabis um, explosion in the US, and I see that most of the big gains are coming out of the well-being and wellness area. But none of you guys mentioned that you're all focused on pharma. Is there plans to go in the wellness direction? And the second part is, if you're going to go in the wellness direction, I think you need more women. I've checked out your websites, and it's all white guys, right? So <laughs> where are the ladies? Because we're leading the, the pack in the US for wellness. Huh? Yeah, I, 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 so I would agree with you on the, on the women comment. Um, as a family office, we actually um, invested in, uh, in another fund um, in the US that is uh, run exclusively by women and they're based in California. They've done incredibly well. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that, the, that there's a problem in, um, in, in us picking uh, funds like that or picking companies like that. It's maybe just that we haven't seen the right ones yet. Um, and then the, the question on, on uh, wellness and recreational in general, yes, I c completely agree with you. Most of the money in this industry right now is coming out of recreational in the US. Um, and I think that's just um, 
the, if you will, the, the lowest hanging ripe fruit um, that's ready for the taking. Pharmaceutical is going to take um, a lot more time overall um, to, to develop. So I think it's a, it's a longer term play. Um, we have some existing investments in um, recreational and wellness, um, but right now we are just not um, looking to add to that at, at this point. But that's not to say that uh, there isn't a great future for all of these rec brands. I mean, in the US and in Europe, I have no doubt that mm. there, are, there are brands that will do exceptionally well. And I think one of the reasons, if I may ask, uh, add to that, um, that the wellness market hasn't exploded the way it does is clearly due to regulatory, the regulatory environment here yeah. still is not there to present the opportunities that you actually have in the US. There's no states or cantons where you can actually have full, the full uh, spectrum of THC-based products uh, and dispensaries and everything that comes along that really sparks this interest. And, uh, so and we're in Europe, it's, we're just not there yet. And uh, on the pharma side, on the other hand, it's relatively clear. Of course, we saw yesterday something is changing in Switzerland. It goes relatively fast. It's pretty clear how it's going to go. Of course, there are some open questions. But there is a clear route. You can present a business plan that is very clear. Where are you going? Where are the revenues going to come from? And in terms of wellness, it's still a big open question mark. Just CBD-based products, cosmetics, that might be a route. But where it really took off in the US is when THC was legalized in Colorado and other states. Yeah, and I mean, let's bear in mind also that when you're competing in the cosmetic space, you're competing against the Niveas of this world. I mean, you're, you have to get that shelf space. And it's, uh, uh, you know, when we're looking at opportunities, we're saying, how are you going to get there? How are you going to actually get those market shares? And um, it's, just, it's just, we're thinking, I'm, I'm thinking of all the money you're going to have to shove into you know, marketing and, and branding and having those reviews from the customers. So for, we see it as, a difficult, uh, a difficult play. Even though you're right with regards to cosmetics. And by the way, we do have a woman uh, a partner with us. We're very happy to have her, and um, and she's running the operations out of uh, out of close to Tel Aviv. Perfect. So we have a next question. Hi, my name is Daniel. I'm from Uruguay. Uh, thank you for your your conversation here. Uh, just wondering if you are you have a forecast on the South American market. Uh, <clears throat> actually, Uruguay has a um, similar regulation to to the Swiss market, so it could become uh, like the Swiss from South America in terms of distribution, in terms of market for our neighbors down in Uruguay, such as Brazil, Brazil and Argentina. Do you have any forecast on South American market? I can answer that, actually. Um, regarding Latin America, I think what I have focused on is we're working closely with the Hemp Association of Latin America, with Lorenzo, which I guess you know him. And what we've seen is a lot is going on down there across all countries, especially on the cultivation side. And I guess they're going to start exp actually exporting things over to Europe and the rest of the world and obviously being competitive. They are the biggest ones in general. Latin America, you know, coffee beans, sugar, all these raw commodities, they're number one there. And obviously, they're coming after hemp and, yeah, and cannabis, for sure. So yes, I think they're going to have a big impact in the world, for sure. Perfect. Hi. Hello. Sorry. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Siegfried Leger from uh, Can Exchange. I'm the CFO over there. And I have a question for the panel, because we talk about a lot of investing, but we don't talk about how we evaluate the investment and how, what do we get for our investment. And doing funding rounds, basically, this is what we realize all the time. How do we put a price in what we're offering to companies? So as a former trader as well, I understand the fair value for investors. So what methodology do you use, guys, to value a cannabis investment? Thank you. Sig, I was thinking about bringing this up in the panel, but it's such a big, it opens up the Pandora's box, right? Uh, it's something we could speak about two hours, but still, if we have the time, let's, let's go for it. We still have some time, right? We have uh, another five minutes. Yeah, we have one more question from the audience. So we, if it would be possible to keep it quite short and not open the Pandora's yeah. box, um, let's try it. So, do you want to go first? Go for it. I'll take so it. we... 
it, it of course it depends on the stage um, which a company is at. Um, as a family office, we do um, because you're of course you're right. It's extremely difficult to put a value on a company at an early stage. We um, do a lot of convertible notes, um, safe notes um, at the early stage for that exact reason because. Oftentimes, when somebody comes to us at a seed stage, it's it's just not really possible to find um, an, an agreeable valuation. But there are ways to work around that. As you progress a little further, there are um, multiples um, in the industry that you can use as a reference point. Thank you, Roberto, for keeping those high. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, Exactly. I mean, I completely re uh, join you on that. I mean, we're looking a lot at, you know, smaller companies. And I mean, the thing is that when, you, when you're looking at a mature company, you can look at the, the P&L and just kind of, you know, look at multiples. But when you're looking at a young company, they don't have a past. So it's really hard to... So you need to understand every little aspect of it. You need to understand it completely. You need to understand how the team is actually deploying that in the shop, which marketing and all of this. And once you understand all of those things, and it's not only marketing, it's, it's everything, you know, all the costs you have there, then it has to translate perfectly into a financial plan that you need to be able to understand. And I mean, this is... It's, it's a longer process for due diligence, you know, but uh, uh, once it translates into financials, then obviously you can start working with potential, you know, estimates of the future and, and start working around there. But it has to start, and especially when you're looking at early stage companies, to really understanding the nuts and bolts of that company, how people are working together. We talked about the team before, um, how they're working together, what they're capable of deploying, where they're going to do it, how they're going to do it. I mean, it's just... It's a lot of questions. Just if I may ask one question to Marcus, because you said there's ways around to work with it. So what you ex essentially do with the convertible note, right, is that you define the valuation at a later stage. Basically, So you yes. provide debt, and yeah. then at the later stage, you, at the, you define which parameters actually exactly. will be relevant for the valuation of the yes. equity. Yeah, and it helps out our lawyers as well. Yeah, it does. <laughs> 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 OK, we have one last question. Hello, um, my name is Matias. I, I come from the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I just heard Marcus talking about um, cannabis medicinal product, pharmaceutical products. Um, um, you said that there were only few approved by the FDA. Um, we have um, in Uruguay some pharmaceutical products, uh, products approved by the Ministry of Health. Um, my question is, um, do you think will make a difference uh, in the raising capital and investment uh, companies to have a um, pharmaceutical product um, habilitation on GMP Uruguayan uh, for export into Latin America, will that make a difference for investments or you will only look into FDA approved uh, medicinals? So first of all, you have to be clear on your um, certifications and quality standards because you mentioned um, GMP. GMP, for example, is a, a facility standard, right? Um, Whereas uh, when I'm talking about FDA registered products, I'm talking about products that uh, medicines that went through phase one, two, and three of uh, a, a clinical trial and that uh, are registered with the FDA and freely prescribable by um, doctors in, in the United States. The reason that I'm mentioning the FDA to get back to your question about Uruguay is that um, at the end of the day, the United States by far is the largest pharmaceutical market in the world, which means FDA certification is kind of the gold standard, if you will, and um, it's relatively easy once you have FDA registration to then come to Europe and get an EMA registration, uh, MHRA in the UK, Swiss Medic, etc. Um, uh, on, on top of that, um, so, w I would have to understand more clearly um, if, if you have products that are registered in Uruguay, what, what the story is behind that. It's, it, it's a bit difficult to answer. And because we're in Switzerland, just to add to that last comment is uh, usually if you want to get a medicine 
um, a fully approved licensed drug by Swiss Medic, you would do it in parallel also with the EMA. Yeah. So you do it two ways because the preparation of the whole file is very similar. Of course, with a few differences, but you wouldn't probably just go for Swiss Medic uh, if you have the potential to also sell in all of Europe. Yeah. FDA is a different animal. Yeah.